Listen. So a lot of people have been recommending this Netflix horror series called The Haunting of Hill House, saying it's the craziest thing out there. It's the most horrific series, one of the best series. And the problem with you guys is that you guys tend to overhype so many things. But not this one. I freaking loved it. Yeah, some episodes do drag a bit. And considering that, you know, I grew up getting hit with La Chancla, I can't say it's the scariest thing I've ever seen. But I'd be lying if I didn't tell you that episodes five and six are some of the best episodes of the year that I would give both of them works of art to. Let me explain. So originally, the story comes from Shirley Jackson's 1959 novel about a group of people who stay overnight at this house to investigate the paranormal activities. It was then made into a movie in 1963 and a visual effects test reel in 1999 starring Owen Wilson as a subject. What do we all need in life? What are the basics? Food, water, shelter. Sex. Wow. I personally first heard of Hill House and its gut-wrenching story from what I consider to be the best adaptation of it, Scary Movie 2. <laughs> but the dope thing about Mike Flanagan is that he's been creating his own little universe of horror films for the longest time, right? And I think that homie here is a real one because not only does he always bring back his cast and crew, but he's always making sure that he's trying to connect everything into the same universe. Like, if this dude had a homeless man on one of the previous sets, I'm pretty sure he offered him a room at Hill House to come. But obviously Johnny was smart enough to say no. So the show does take its liberties from the book, starting off with its two little timelines. You got the past storyline where we see the family buy this house for the summer in order to fix it up and then flip it for cash. And then we have the present storyline where, well, it turns out the house flips dumb. Each episode takes the lost approach of having it focus on one character or moment. And Flanagan confirmed how each sibling is supposed to be one of the stages of grief, considering all of the jacked up stuff they dealt with while growing up in that house. And beyond that, this dude legit structured the entire show knowing the psyche of us people who have Netflix accounts that we tend to binge three episodes at a time, so he wrote the story according to that. Genius. Episode 1 starts off with Steve, who a lot of people think is the worst of the siblings. It's Shirley. But the reason people hate on Dario over here is because he's always spitting some crazy facts that people just don't have the balls to hear. Most times they're just what we want to see. He could work on his tone though. He pretty much is the Stephen King of this universe and he's written all these Amityville-like books that have made him famous, but his siblings hate the fact that he appropriated what they believed in growing up and he turned it into profit even though he thinks it's all fake. He's like those atheist producers who learned how much Christian films can make. This man embodies his denial so much that he refuses to have children with his wife. He believes that the reason his mom committed suicide when he was younger was because of an illness and in order to not pass that on, dude gets a damn vasectomy. So the next episode is on Shirley, who embodies anger better than this guy. However, when you grow up seeing Jack stuff like this, can you really blame her? It's over. She's the one who's most pissed off at Steven and thinks that she got everyone to back away and not take his money, but they all took his money including her husband, and that's why she's always tweaking, right? Like, she's the PTA mom who pulls up angry at McDonald's before she's even ordered her McNuggets. She's always bossing her husband around as if she didn't have a fling on the side that she's hiding. So it's no wonder that when she goes into work, she's surrounded by dead people. Her equals. Messed up thing about it is that in the first episode, the youngest sibling Nell actually goes back to the house and she ends up being found dead. And because Shirley's the funeral director, she's the one who ends up opening her own sister's body and that same bug thing happens again. So now we get the third oldest of the three and if y'all have seen the movie Hush, you'll be surprised that she uh, actually speaks a lot in this one. Why are you yelling at him? Because the dumbwaiter is not a toy, it can be dangerous. That's all you need to say then. Fair enough. But what's also crazy about it is how all of these showrunners are married to some of the most beautiful women in the world, right? So all I can think about is, when you're directing your wife in a scene like this, do, uh, do you, do you, do you call cut super quick or do you, Theo has the ability to sense things with her hands, so she's wearing these Doctor Strange-like gloves all the time, and even though she always wanted to be a dancer and... She does do that here and there. She ends up growing up to use those powers as a child psychologist. In fact, at the end of episode 3, it turns into the easiest episode of To Catch a Predator because all she needed to do was sit on a couch and they fogled that dude right out of there real quick. But of course, with great power 
comes a very sad ending to every episode in the show. Now, Luke and Noah are the twins who shared the same room and I feel saw the most jacked up stuff. Like, Luke would have been the older one who loved spending time in his treehouse. He's always seeing this random little girl named Abigail who no one else really believes is real. He dresses up like an adorable Babadook looking kid and then he grows up to be a drug addict. Again, this was his childhood. <laughs> Even though my man looks like Aaron Rodgers, the only thing he's touching down on is his dignity since he always has to beg his siblings for money. He's got a recovering friend who just keeps jipping him off. And worst of all, this guy still sees more ghosts than Luigi as an adult. <laughs> Episode 5 is a damn work of art. Let me explain. Episode 5 takes you back to how Nell, the youngest of the bunch, was always seeing this ghost known as the Bent Neck Lady. Like, this thing has been popping out over and over for every episode. I'm over here thinking that this was going to be like the Thanos of the house that they were going to have to fight in the after credits. And hot damn was it worse than that. Growing up, her mom would promise her a specific necklace that she would get when she was older in order to calm her down from all of the things that she was seeing, right? Girl was always getting pushed to the side when she just wanted a tea party, her twin brothers inviting a random chick named Abigail to spend the night and we don't even know if she's real. But there's even a scene where Nell just disappears from plain sight in front of everybody, looking like those prank videos on YouTube. Okay. Go girl, I'm smiling, I'm sorry. You got it. You got it, let me see, let me see. Oh my god! Oh my god! Oh my god! So of course years later she gets therapy. Do you drink coffee? Uh, yeah, I... Are you... Are you asking me if I want to get coffee? Uh, it's, uh, it's for the health history section in your file. Oh, I'm... I'm sorry. No, 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 I, don't be. No, I, I really misread that. I was that. planning on waiting until the end of your visit to ask you out for coffee. Oh, it goes in! The little montage they give Nell and her soon-to-be husband, I thought was freaking adorable, but I should have known better than to get invested in it. It's just, though, most husbands don't want to help their wives do the dishes. This man was helping his woman fight off demons psychologically, and she... He did. Of course, they didn't say that he had an aneurysm and that's what killed him, but all of us with a Netflix account know exactly what we saw. And now Nell is worse than ever since the bent neck lady is still hanging around haunting her. And you would think that the rest of the family would be there for her and at least pick up the phone. No. She goes to the house and the ghosts of her family welcome her to this creepy ceremony where she finally sees her man again. And man, y'all demons really do this girl bogus. They let her have her little Cap and Peggy dance only to end up hanging herself after she thinks she's putting on the necklace her mom promised her as a little girl when it's really the noose. She falls down and... Bro, she's the bent neck lady! So after completely blowing my mind with that interdimensional demonology, the showrunners were like, nah, we're gonna hit you with another banger of an episode. This entire episode takes place in between a funeral home and a flashback scene during a storm, but the crazy part of it is how it's split into these insane long one takes. I don't know how many of you have seen that behind the scenes snippet for the Mr. Rogers Jim Carrey show, but I am a complete and utter sucker when it comes to long choreographed scenes like these. And in episode 6, they would twirl the camera around and somehow replace the body that was inside the coffin. They would enter in a character and by the time it moved around, the entire cast gets swapped out for their younger selves before going back and bringing the originals back in. There's even a transition that goes from the older dad going to the bathroom and getting so lost he finds his younger self in a flashback. It's wild. It's funny, Nellie was always trying to get all of us together. Someone should have told her she didn't have to try this hard. Okay. Y'all colder than the halls in your house. That's you think you know what my happened problem. that night? My You're problem. out of a goddamn- the wrong parent died! <laughs> So let me take a quick second to acknowledge some of the easter eggs in this bad boy because there are certain points where they bring some of the original actors from the first movie in here to make a little cameo. They slipped in an E.T. easter egg since Henry Thomas plays the flashback daddy. Flanagan even sneaks in a couple homages to his other previous films which I think is always pretty cool for directors to do. But hands down the best ones, the ones that make you feel like a kid again with those I Spy books 
are all of the hidden goals in the background of each episode. So in episode seven and nine is when we get a little fleshing out of the parents, right? We start off with the dad as we learn that he pretty much became Bob the Builder that summer as he was trying to fix the house. He gets acquainted with the Dudleys who've been the caretakers of this property, but even though they know not to be there at night since, you know, the wife used to live there and she had nightmares that were so bad they had to cause a miscarriage, they're always coming in to try to warn them, right? Like Mr. Dudley Dunn declared deliriously that this dwelling was demented, but Henry was just like, nah. We're good. Until his wife pulls the mouth from Inception. We then get to know a bit about the mom in episode 9, played by the glorious Carla Cugino, who, I'm not saying that my Spy Kids nostalgia is getting the best of me, but like, have y'all seen her in Gerald's game? My woman still got it. Carla is like a fine wine. She's the image that pops up when you search up the word woman in the dictionary. She is one of the few actors who looks better than her younger version in the movie Watchmen. Carla is what I assume Eve would have looked like back in the day. She does also lose her mind in this one though. Throughout the series, she's suffering from these migraines. Everything keeps running in circles for her. She keeps walking past this Mario dude who's not even living. But what starts being her breaking point is when she starts having these dreams where she's interacting with the previous homeowner whose kids died as well. She starts getting worried that the outside world is gonna hurt her kids when they get older. So, you know, she decides to not let them get older. She gives me another reason besides Alice on why I'll never attend a tea party as she fills up these cups with rat poison and gives it to them right before the dad comes in and stops them. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh no. Turns out that Abigail is real and she's a Dudley's kid who they just like Harry Pottered away and in what I think is the second saddest scene in the show, the couple realizes that as long as the house is around, they'll still be able to see their ghost daughter who's gonna reside in it. So they make Mr. Crane promise that he'll never sell it or demolish it and since he's holding on to his dead wife as well, he's like, word. Wait, not now. I can explain. Let me. In the present, they're all scrambling around after Nell's funeral because Luke headed off to the house in hopes of burning it, but we all know it's going to consume him. These sisters finally hash out their problems by punching each other in the boob, which, you know, always good comedic relief until... Bro, if this happens to me, I don't give a damn how much my mortgage is. I'm booking an Airbnb for a week. The boys then go to the house to stop Luke, and even though they specifically told the girls to stay put, they decide to hop in a car and bicker all the way- Cheryl, what more proof do you need? So by the end of it, they all end up back at the house for what's like the biggest intervention ever in this red room with their dead sister's ghost. Turns out that this red room is like the stomach of the house. You know, the titles were clearly emphasizing how the entire home is like a labyrinth that shifts over and over. There's even a point where throughout the entire series, the mom has been working on these blueprints and unbeknownst to her, they're actually blueprints of the house she's living in. So this place has full control. That means that this red room was changing for each family member. So it was the reading room for the mom, the game room, 
room for Steve, family room for Shirley, dance studio for Theo, and the playroom for Nell. Each one had a red door and this super long vertical window as an easter egg, kind of just showing you how it became like a Rorschach for them. This thing was like an NSA wiretap feeding into their emotions and fears. A ghost can be a lot of things. A memory, a daydream, a secret, grief, anger, guilt. But in my experience, most times they're just what we want to see. And it's with the revelation of that that you start realizing that the house was kind of embodying them in a sense. That they were the key to that red room. And how maybe if you want to look at it that way, all of the ghosts were internal stuff. It's like in episode 3 with the Mr. Smiley ghost, you know. It wasn't an actual ghoul that was coming after the little girl, but a pervert who was an even scarier monster than that. Showing us that all of our internal demons are sometimes the most terrifying things. Damn. Yeah, that was deep. Hold up, let me, I need the right music. I would say that the scariest part of Hill House is the family dynamic. How every house literally shifts as the family grows older. How every member plays a part of the body, and without one, the whole thing can go limp and affect the rest. And in the case of Hill House, at the end, it ends up being their place of refuge, the place that's looking out for them. A place where the dead don't go away, but live on. And a place that helps them move on from their troubles so they can truly live happily ever after. Except, wasn't it the damn house that caused all those troubles to begin with? Thank you guys for checking out this video. I'm curious to know your thoughts down below in the comment section. I know y'all have been asking for this. Some of y'all don't even know how to ask for stuff. Y'all demanded. Y'all be tweeting me, DMing me, telling me to listen up to do the... You know what? Hopefully... The 20 minutes were worth it. I really wanted to make sure this one was jam-packed with a bunch of info and stuff because I, I really liked the show. I thought it was a very good uh, orchestrated show. I have rewatched it twice already, three times with a couple of certain episodes, five and six, because I think those are masterpieces. But I'm curious to know other things that you guys are catching because the beauty of it, I love watching something and knowing that there's still things that probably aren't going to be discovered till like years later. So th I think it's one of the most cra well-crafted things on Netflix. I'm curious to see what he's going to do with the shiny sequel and i'm just curious to know your guys thoughts about it don't forget to comment like and subscribe and you'll win a free trip to stay at rose red